so today what we want to do is finish up our discussion of banking. Uh, what we've been talking about are these so-called on balance sheet activities. We've talked about basically the sources of funds and the uses of to which the uh, banks put the funds, the dollars coming in, deposits, borrowing, capital, and then the uses, the assets are required, primary reserves, secondary reserves, loans, and then investments or bonds. Okay, if you remember, there's interest that is paid to acquire these funds, there's interest that is received on these funds, and then the difference between that, recall the, the difference, what we call that difference? The net interest margin, and this is the bulk of where banks get their profits, is by basically bringing dollars in and sending dollars out and marking them up on the way. Okay, There are other bank activities, and so we'll just talk about a few other topics. One is this, there are off-balance sheet activities. And those earn, and these are really just services, and those earn profits for banks, okay? Profits over and above what they can earn from their net interest margin, the marking up of funds that come through. Uh, Off-balance sheet activities are basically just bank services that don't show up either as assets or liabilities of the bank, okay? And let's just kind of go through a few of these that banks uh, provide these services, and it's basically just service for a fee. Here we go, is trust services. Okay, or sometimes called private banking. What banks do for customers, some customers, not most of us, but for some customers, what they do is they manage money for people. And so, if you're a fairly wealthy person, you could go to a bank and say, hey, I've got a million dollars and I have these kids or grandkids, I would like to leave it to them. Or it could be, I've got some charities I'd like to leave some money for, and rather than me manage all this money, I'd like for you to take over management of it. And then the bank would say, okay. And they would have a department, a trust department, and the trust department, these are not deposits. You're not making a deposit in an account. You've got some money, and you just go to the bank and say, would you manage this money for me? And they say, okay. And they could take some of that money in the management and put it into, for example, time deposits but they could also buy stocks or bonds with it or other types of investment, okay? And so when they do this, this is not considered ordinary banking, the taking of deposits and so forth. This is just a service. And why do banks do this? Well, they got into these services as functions closely related to banking under the old Glass-Steagall Act. It's like, hey, as a in the due course of us managing our bank, we need to have certain information about financial markets, and since we had this information anyway in order to do a good job of running our bank, then could we sell these services to somebody else? And the answer is yeah. There are a few non-deposit trust companies that have bank charters. They go to the control of the currency and apply for a charter and have a charter as a bank and don't even accept deposits. They just set up out here and say, hey, we'll manage money for you. Okay, so didn't I say here private banking sometimes this is called? But trust services is a very common term for this. It's a trust department at a bank, and any large bank, medium sized or large bank, is going to have a trust department where they do this. And they charge a fee for these uh, services. For example, they might say, We're going to charge you 1% of whatever you give us. So if you give us a million dollars to manage and we charge you 1% a year, that'd be $10,000 a year. Okay? And these services can go on even after you would pass away. Okay? So anyway, that would be an example. How about this one? <laughs> Lines of credit. or just a loan commitment. Sometimes what happens, I believe I've already mentioned this before, 
is customers, and usually we're talking about business customers, would go to a bank and say, hey, I would like to talk with you about getting a pre-approved loan. And so the bank would say, okay. And then you sit down, you go through the entire application process, fill out all the forms, provide all the information about your income and so forth, and then the bank at some point says yes or no, but yes, we will be willing to offer you, a, basically make a commitment to you that we will lend you up to and then a certain amount. And they might say, depends on if it's a small business, they might say a quarter of a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. If it's a large business, they might say, we're willing to lend you up to five hundred million dollars and all you have to do is just write a check. And of course, if it were five hundred million dollars, probably not write a check, probably an electronic transfer. But the point is, once somebody comes back to the bank and says, hey, we've got a check presented on your bank, the banker just says, oh, okay. They honor that check, and at that point, you've drawn on your line of credit that you have with the bank. I told you that this represents risk because uh, if you look at a bank, let's say they issue a line of credit to some company, and they say, oh, we will lend you up to $500 million. No questions asked later. We've already asked those questions. We'll loan you up to $500 million. And you say, okay, and then you don't take the, the $500 million on that day. But they've made a commitment. And then we just go on day after day after day, week after week. And let's say we get into a recession. And your business that's got this line of credit is kind of doing not so well. Maybe customers are going away. Nothing wrong with your product, but they're just going away because, or maybe there is something wrong with your product, but the point is there's bad news. Maybe they're going away, the economy's turning down, and they just, people can't afford to buy. And now your business is saying, oh my gosh, we are not selling stuff. We're not generating our revenues. That's okay. We can always write a check for $500 million. Well, if your business is not doing so well, it was doing better on the day you got the line of credit, and it's not so doing, doing so well right now. The banker that said, hey, write a check anytime you need it, that banker is at this point making a risky loan. It didn't look risky on the day they extended the line of credit, but it looks risky today. And so the point is, if we want to understand how much risk a bank is taking, it's not enough to just say, well, today it's got very little risk. If it's got a line of credit outstanding, if it's committed to make loans for, you know, like I say, $100,000, $500 million, anything in between, then that banker could be on the line for some really risky loans at some point down the road. And very often, of course, what they'll do is put in their certain conditions under which that line of credit would be reduced or even withdrawn. But I'm just saying to you that there's no loan that's made. If it were a loan, it'd be over here in the uses of funds. We'd say, oh, a loan, $300 million to the XYZ Corporation. But it doesn't show up there. It's off the balance sheet. And yet it's a risky activity. Since it's risky, and since its regulators are looking at this and potentially, not punishing it, but holding uh, the company to account or the bank to account for the risk it's taking, then that bank doesn't just say, oh yeah, no problem. That bank says, we have to be paid for this. We are taking risk. Okay, and so then there's going to be some income in some form or another. It could be that they just charge a fee. Okay, it could be a certain number of basis points or percent of the line of credit. They could say something like this. Okay, we'll loan you up to, I'll use an easy number, $100 million, and we're going to charge you one half percent per year on that while this loan is not being drawn on, or this line of credit is not being drawn on. Half percent per year, and then if you do draw on it, you start paying interest at whatever the interest rate is we charge on CNI loans, commercial industrial loans and then there'd be a fee. Another way of doing that would be, oh, line of credit, we'll give you a line of credit up to, we'll say $100 million, but for you to get that line of credit, you've got to have, let's say, $10 million in a checking account that earns no interest and just maintain that balance there all the time, 10 million bucks. And so then the bank would have access to that compensating balance is what that's called. The bank would have access to that checking account balance and could earn profits off of that throughout the year. Okay, Some way or another, they are going to get paid for that service, that risk they are taking. 
okay? And you can only offer so many lines of credit until finally you go, oh my gosh, we've got, let's say, a billion dollar bank and we've offered to make loans of $3 billion. And you just can't be doing stuff like that. You can't go around issuing you know, these promises. If you could, and if there's no regulation of this, then you could have a $1 billion bank and offer in lines of credit to, to lend out $100 billion and then charge somebody interest on that and go, wow, what a great day. But somebody, if there's a $100 billion worth of lines of credit, somebody's gonna start writing checks. Those have to be honored. So there ha there's regulation of this. The regulators are looking at it. They consider this a risky activity, okay? Here's another service, letters of credit. Oh, by the way, let me go back before I go on to this. The line of credit. The terminology here is like this. You've drawn on your line of credit or you've drawn down your line of credit. And that's the terminology. You've drawn against it or drawn down on that. And so if you had a $100 million line of credit and you take $5 million, you've drawn down 5 you still have 95 It's not like you have to take it all at the same time. Okay, just a little terminology there. Letter of credit. This is really a loan guarantee. And again, this is something that doesn't apply. In theory, it could apply to anybody, but mainly we are talking about a business borrower will go to the bank and say, hey, I need a letter of credit. It's kind of like if a student would come to a professor and say, I want you to write me a recommendation. A little bit like that, okay? And so what they say is something like this. Oh, the XYZ Corporation has come to me and they wanted a letter of credit. And so I'm providing that. And they are basically saying this to somebody. Let's say that your corporation, the XYZ Corporation, is a utility company, electric utilities. And what you do is you buy coal, and that coal gets delivered to you, you burn the coal, generate the power, sell the power, then charge your customers, you get paid, and you pay, a pay off your coal supplier, right? And so let's say that you place an order with this coal supplier and say, hey, send me $10 million worth of coal. And they say, okay, give me $10 million. And you go, well, how about if I pay you at the end of the month? And they say, oh, so you want us to give you $10 million worth of coal on credit? And you go, yeah. And they say, how do I know you're going to pay me? And you go, hey, it's me. Uh, you know I'm going to pay you. And then they say, well, no, we don't know that. Why don't you get a letter of credit from your bank? So you come over to your banker, that would be me in this story, and you say, hey, I want to talk to you for a second. And I say, yeah, what can I do for you? And you say, you know, my supplier wanted a letter of credit which says basically you, the banker, will pay for that coal if I can't. But I can. You know I can. And I say, yeah, I think you can because you're doing business with me and I'm watching your bank account, you know, the balance and it go up and down. I see you got revenues coming in. You got money coming out. I think you can. And you say, okay, well, would you be willing to guarantee this loan, write a recommendation for me to tell that coal supplier to give me that $10 million worth of coal that I'll pay him at the end of the month? And this isn't a recommendation like your professor because I don't just say to the coal supplier, give him the coal, he's going to pay you. Trust me. What they want me to say is this, is that they will pay you, you know, the electrical, electrical generating company, utility company will pay for that coal, or if they don't, I will. And of course, if I do, then that means you owe me. I'm paying them for the coal, and now there's a loan has been made, and you have to pay that under certain terms that we set. But anyway, so the, the uh, letter of credit is a loan guarantee. And for an individual, not that the bank is really going to do much of this, but for an individual, you might come to your parents and say, hey, would you co-sign a loan for me? And so there, you go to the bank, you get a loan for $10,000, let's say, to buy a car, and then the, your parents or grandparents or uncle or aunt or somebody like that co-signs the loan, and that means if you don't pay the loan, they will. And we know where that ends up, right? You don't pay the loan, and then they do. And then there's hard feelings, and it goes on forever. No, I'm just kidding. Who knows? Uh, I know that does happen. So anyway, if somebody comes to you and says, would you co-sign a loan, say, 
boy, I cannot hear a thing today. And then go and hide someplace so they can't ask you again. That's just a theory of mine, but it works for me. Anyway, so this is a service, this letter of credit. It's a loan guarantee. It says either you will get paid or I'll pay you. This would most often arise not with some utility company and a coal supplier 200 miles away. Most often this would arise in international trade where there is some company, let's say a car dealership in, uh, you know, in your hometown dealing with a car manufacturer in Japan or Germany or something like this or Yugoslavia saying, hey, ship those cars over here and we'll pay you $10 million or whatever at the end of the month. And then they are far away and also have a great deal of difficulty coming over here, you know, and twisting your arm and making you pay. And so then what they want is somebody like a bank to jump in there and guarantee that payment. And that would be, you know, this international trade is where this would arise the most often. Okay, and then let's add one more and stop at this list, investment banking services. And this is the kind of stuff that also, I mentioned Glass-Steagall a while ago, banks started getting into this under the Glass-Steagall Act originally said no, but then over the years the Federal Reserve lengthened that list of activities closely related to banking. And so what happened, I don't know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that, is banks started getting into this business and now they're into it a lot more than they used to be. Glass-Steagall, after all, has been scaled back a lot. Inve investment banking services is this. If a government or a company wants to issue securities, and securities, stocks or bonds, or some type of bond, sometimes they're called notes or debentures, or they have different terms. But anyway, if some corporate or governmental borrower wants to issue securities, they need advice and help. You know, you can be sitting over here managing some big company and say, oh, I want to issue stock in my company, or I want to issue bonds, and then you say, Hmm, what do I do? And you don't just get on your word processor, put this is a bond from the XYZ Corporation, write a little bit of text out, put that on the copy machine, make a hundred copies, and then go out on the street and start selling those. Right? And this is a bond, you know, and you can kind of imagine uh, some amateurish example, XYZ Corporation, $1,000, you know, 5% coupon, 30 years, Hence, we'll pay this off. Okay, let's make, let's make 100 of these and then sell them out on the sidewalk. Sell them to customers as they go through the cash register. That ain't how it happens. How does it happen? See, I threw in that word ain't just to show the whole amateurish attempt that this would involve. What we do is we go to some bank, and usually we're not talking about a small bank. We go to a fairly large bank with some investment banking department or division, and we say, you know, I want to issue a bond or I want to issue some stock, and I want to go back to your investment bankers and talk to them and get their advice. And then they'll sit down look at all the information from your company, and not just for today, but what, what does your business do? How long have you been uh, in business? How many customers? What's your product? What are your plans for the future? All kinds of stuff, because here's the deal. Once we, I mean, the first thing we're gonna try to do is decide in the investment banking department, what's the best way for you to finance your operations? Would it be smart to issue a bond? If a bond, would it be smart to go short term, medium term, long term? Or would it be smarter to issue stock? That's a decision that has to be made. So, and that is really something that you would study in the finance department. That's a, fi a financing issue. And so they've got financial experts here that can say, here's the best way to fund your corporation. And then once that decision has been made, what they're um, start thinking about is, hey, how are we gonna sell this? 
You know, this has got to be sold. Like, there is no market for just a bunch of pieces of paper, or not much of a market, I should say. This is all a marketing uh, deal. Just like if you're selling refrigerators or fishing lures, we want to get the word out to the most likely customers, and we want to make this look great. What are we going to say? How are we going to advertise this? Are we going to put this in uh, Wall Street Journal, New York Times? Where are we going to get the word out? Who are we going to call? There are people that are running mutual fund companies, pension funds. Are we going to contact them? What are we going to do? And so this department is not only helping you decide what kind of security to come out with, but maybe there's a mixture of securities, a little bit of stock, a little bit of bond. Of the bonds, a little bit short term, a little bit long term. So they're helping you with that and they're helping you basically come up with a marketing plan for this. And then they take care of the, all the registration issues that have to be done. You know, uh, these securities have to be registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. Well, what are the rules for that? And if you know, you're running some little company over here, you have no idea what those rules are or how to comply with them. You haven't been through this before. This investment banking department of, the, of your bank, they've been through that a lot of times. They do it over and over. Okay, so, okay, here are all the registration requirements and so forth. And they've got printers that they work with. If we're going to print up an actual certificate, you don't just put this on the copy machine. Be sure and use some red font. It looks really nice. You know, that's not how you do it. This is going to be printed up by a, a print shop in a professional way and kind of a nice pretty logo up at the top and so forth. All these things have to be done and more. And so we go to the investment bank and there are freestanding investment banks. There are just companies that have nothing to do with a banking company, just an investment bank. And they're called bank, but they are not the kind of bank we're talking about over here, taking in deposits, making loans. This investment bank is really uh, falls into the area of finance, not only the theory of finance, but the practice of it, of what do we do to finance our company, our industrial company or financial company or whatever. And so then the investment bank provides all those services for a fee. In recent years, a lot of the, the big investment banks were failing or having a great deal of trouble during that financial crisis that started, really it started in 2007, extended into 08 and 09. But a lot of the investment banks were having trouble, and so the big investment banks and uh, Merrill Lynch, for example, would be a great uh, example. Merrill Lynch has been in business for, it's easy to say forever, but Merrill Lynch has been in business for a long, long time. They were a big investment bank, either number one or number two in size. And during this, uh, this financial crisis that occurred, um, they were losing lots of money. And so then they merged with, or were taken over by, uh, Bank of America. And so now there's the Bank of America company with its ordinary banking division, but then they also have their investment bank division, the Merrill Lynch people, and that's the kind of stuff they do. But there are smaller banks other than just the largest ones in the country. There are smaller banks that offer investment banking services. I think banks started getting, and I said 15 or 20 years ago, I think the first entry of banks into investment banking, just ordinary banks, um, after Glass-Steagall, I think there was this long period, Glass-Steagall 1933, I'm going to say up until the mid-80s, sometime along in there, uh, maybe 1990s, sometime uh, in that period, banks were out of the investment banking business, and then I believe what happened is they got to get in there just as providing these services to governmental units, state and local governments. Okay. Investment banks do have capital wrapped up in all this, because here's one thing investment banks will do. The XYZ company might come to them and say, hey, give us a hand. And they say, okay. And then they go through there all these different things. And then maybe the investment bank does this. They say, hey, here's what we're going to do. And this isn't always done. It just sometimes is done. You want to borrow $300 million. We're going to buy all those from you. All those stocks or uh, those certificates or all the bonds that you want to sell, we're going to buy all those. And you're trying to get $300 million. Well, what we're going to do is this. We're going to print up, let's say, $350 million worth of stock or bond certificates. And we're going to give you your $300 million. Here you go. And then we will take the risk of going out and selling these and getting our $350 million. 
Anything we can get over $300 million, we keep. Anything we get under, we lose. And so the bank holding company that owns this investment banking department or division, the bank holding company has got to have capital in this where they have invested something and then if they make a mistake and they say, oh, here's your $300 million, now let's go out and sell it. Oh, we only sold those securities for $275 million. Uh-oh. What do we do then? And the answer is the owners of that investment bank lose. It came out of them. You got your money, the XYZ Corporation, you got your money, here's your $300 million up front. So, to just take the story a little bit more uh, further and tie it back into where we've been before, in 2007 and 8 and 9 when we went through this uh, financial crisis, investment banks had got into the business of selling bonds that were mortgage-backed securities and bonds that were backed by car loans and they got into that business. They printed up their own bonds and they were holding a portfolio and then they said, oh, we paid, I'll use the same numbers before, $300 million to buy a bunch of mortgages and now we'll go out and sell $350 million of the bonds and they couldn't because the value of the mortgages went down. The housing market was, uh, was not collapsing but it was under a lot of pressure, and so what happens is the value of those mortgages went down, so when they went out to sell those bonds, oh, we can only get $250 million. We lost $50 million. Only with the larger investment banks, it was not millions, it was billions. So anyway, um, this is a risky business. It can be super profitable. In good times, investment banking is more profitable than commercial banking. And so in good times, this is a very profitable activity, investment banking. In bad times, this loses big money. Okay. Now, so we've got this bank. It's earning profits from its on-balance sheet activities. It's earning profits from off-balance sheet activities. It also needs to manage risk. We've already talked about default risk, so I won't go into that again. Default risk has to do with asymmetric information and minimizing that. You remember we talked about having loan officers and acquiring collateral and all these different activities. So banks have to do that in a normal year This third item under the uses were loans, you remember. In a normal year, a bank is going to have to write off 1%, more or less, of its loan portfolio is going to be lost due to bad loans. And that's an average. There are some banks that are making riskier loans and some banks not so risky loans. But anyway, that would be kind of a normal thing. Okay, and how, does, how do you keep that down to 1%? You think about that for a second. If you go take a test, you know, if I say, oh, we're going to have a test tomorrow, and you just study, 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 and you think, I'm pretty smart, and then you just study, 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 and you come in here and you go, I got 96%. Hey, look at that. Well, you missed 4%. If these guys miss 4%, they're not having a good day, or week, or month, or year, or career. So... To manage default risk, you have to say no sometimes, and at other times what you have to do is work extra hard to monitor those loans, make sure that money's coming in, get right after it. If it's not coming in, get good uh, collateral and so forth. Here's a second type of risk we want to talk about. Liquidity risk or liquidity, I'll say, management. The risk is that you're not liquid. I've mentioned it before. Here's why a bank has to be liquid. You take that money in from depositors and you promise them they can have that back. And if they can't have it back, your name is mud. They are going to tell everybody 
that you are a crook. And I mean, that's the kind of talk they'll say. They took my money, they got my paycheck, and now I can't buy groceries. And so you've got to have enough liquidity to always provide for withdrawals by your depositors. And the second thing is you need liquidity because you always want to say yes to borrowers. If they're good borrowers, if they're going to pay you back, you never want to say, oh gosh, this would be a great loan. I wish I had $10 million to give you. I just don't. Sorry. Because they will go across the street and get that money. And then they will shift all their activity across the street, their business, and you didn't just lose this loan. You lost them probably for years and years, maybe forever. And so you always want to say yes. You always want to be liquid. There's two ways of managing liquidity. There's asset management and there's liability management. When we were talking about the funds, uh, the bank's uses of funds, what we said is the bank has some liquid assets that earn no interest, but they try to hold a minimum number of those primary reserves. If they have liquidity needs, they try to hold secondary reserves. And so that is what I mean by liquidity manage or asset management holding assets that are liquid. And if you remember, the secondary reserves would be things like treasury bills and marketable CDs issued by other banks, right? How about Fed funds sold? We will lend dollars to other banks for one day. And we might roll them over, roll them over, roll them over, but we can get them back in one day if we need them. Right? So we talked about these liquid assets. And this is really what you would call old style, old school liquidity management. Here's what I mentioned to you. We've got a yield curve. And the yield curve's got a positive slope. So if we're holding secondary reserves, we're not getting much interest, right? And that low interest is what we are sacrificing. Here's uh, what, just investments or bonds. And so there is some number of basis points here, like uh, 200 basis points, that would be 2%, that we are sacrificing while we hold on to secondary reserves. Now, here's the problem with that. I mean, this is not a problem if you need that, but we're just talking about sitting around holding on to treasury bills, let's say, and just kind of waiting around going, well, you know, if I ever need liquidity, I'll have it. And then you wait, and the days pass, and the weeks pass, and the months pass. And if we ever need liquidity, we all have it. Yeah, so you're paying for something day after day after day, paying in terms of opportunity cost, interest you didn't receive. When does this need come along? We don't know. Some liquidity needs are predictable. Some are not predictable, so we're just sitting around waiting and holding a bunch of liquid assets. You could do the same thing. You could say, you know, maybe when I'm driving on vacation, I'll have a flat tire and have to have the car towed in, a tire replaced. And so what I'm going to do is just always carry $500 in my pocket. So you put the $500 in your pocket and just go through life. And oh, I didn't have a flat tire. Well, I still got the $500. And then day after day, week after week, you got that $500 in your pocket. It's not earning anything for you. So this is kind of an inefficient form of being liquid. You are liquid, but it's kind of inefficient. You're paying even when you don't need it. Liability management is this. It says, I'm not keeping a lot of li liquid assets around, but when I need liquidity, when I need cash, I'll borrow it. Borrow liquidity. And so... I'll sit around with minimal secondary reserves, not much assets tied up in a liquid form, and then 
Now, I don't mean to say zero either, but then if something happens and somebody comes in and says, I need to borrow $10 million, you say, hey, have a seat. If this, and we'll process it. Hey, you, you deserve it. $10 million, we're going to do that. But you don't have $10 million in, in the vault or at the Fed that you can let go in excess reserves. You don't have liquidity like that. What are you going to do? And the answer is borrow it. Purchase Fed funds, for example. Okay, and so this is called, sometimes these are called, there's different terms, but managed liabilities. or purchased funds these are just different terms for the same idea and I mentioned one hey purchase fed funds just I always want to say call up but usually this is done electronically there is a fed funds market where these dollars are floating around out there and there are actually brokers and dealers in fed funds and so you just contact them and go hey I need 10 million dollars when do you need it overnight okay here's the interest rate okay it's a deal shake hands electronically send all the right paperwork the dollars get transferred into your account overnight so tomorrow you say to the customer hey you're approved on the 10 million dollars <laughs> write a check and by the time they can write that check and it can appear for presentation, those dollars are in your account. And so you didn't have anything just sitting there waiting. And when you need the money, go get it. Now, another example, that would be purchasing Fed funds, but another form of borrowing uh, liquidity would be this. You know, we talked about over here with the deposits coming in, Transaction deposit, non-transaction. And of the non-transaction, we talked about small and large. And what I told you was those large CDs, and large time deposits, this is money that's owned by fairly sophisticated lenders, investors, all around the United States. Some of them are companies, some of them are people. And so what you could say is something like this. Wow, people are coming in here wanting to borrow money. Here's what we'll do. We have been offering to pick out a number, 4% on CDs of a half a million dollars or more. We've been paying 4%, that's competitive. Let's offer 4.1%. And if you raise from 4%, which everybody's paying, to 4.1, what will happen is all around the United States, people start sending money to you. Why? To get that extra one-tenth of 1%. And within a day or two, you'll have large amounts of money coming to your bank because the people with this money are paying close attention. There are websites out there. You can go on to uh, Google or something like this and find who pays the most on time deposits. And there are websites that say here are the top 10 interest rates on time deposits of various sizes, under 100,000, over 100,000. And so if you had a large amount of money, you just go to these websites all the time. It's like, oh, here's this bank that's jumped from down here paying average to a little bit above average. I'm going to send them money. And the next day, you might have $10 million coming in. And so that would be another example, large time deposits where you raise that rate a little bit. Yes, you could raise the rate, could, on small time deposits, but what's going to happen is the small time deposits are owned by people with small amounts of money that aren't paying close attention, they're more loyal to just keeping their money at the bank down on the corner that they've always done business with. And so if you raise your rate, not many people notice and not much money flows to you. You want to get a large amount of money in a short period of time, do it on a large time deposit. Here it comes. So anyway, this is the newer style of liability management. Here's what people do for uh, asset management, liability management. Rather than you walk around that $500 in cash in your pocket all the time waiting for the tire to blow out or some other emergency to come along, you might have to go to the emergency room, carry a credit card, right? And you go, hey, if I need some cash to cover these unpredictable expenses, I'll borrow it with my credit card. 
And so I'm saying that this is a little bit like a credit card for a bank. It's not a credit card, but a little bit that same thing. Questions? Finally, interest risk. or interest rate risk. We had the graph before talking about this, if you remember. Remember, a bond is purchased, and the interest rate is whatever. The coupon is equal to the market on that day. The coupon rate is locked in on that bond. The par value is locked in, and you pay the market price that day. And then after that day, and we've got a coupon that's locked in and a par value that's locked in, after that day, market interest rates fluctuate up and down. And so if interest rates would go up in the marketplace, then the market price of that bond goes down. You remember that discussion? And then also, we added this one other dimension, years to maturity, that if we have something that's very short-term maturity, a month, there's not much fluctuation in the price, but if we have something that's long maturity, like 30 years, then big fluctuation in price. Now, this applies to bonds with fixed coupon interest rates, because that's part of the story is what causes this. That coupon is locked in, but also it applies to loans with fixed coupons, fixed interest rates. Where does the market price for a loan go down? And the answer is the amount that Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or Jenny Mae would pay for that bond would go down. Or the amount that some investment bank would pay for that, did I say bond, that a mortgage. The amount that some, Fannie Mae would pay for a mortgage or a loan, or the amount that some investment bank would pay for it. That would go down if interest rates are up. That investment bank would be buying that so it can issue its own mortgage-backed securities. So anyway, this is the kind of risk we're talking about. Fluctuation in interest rates means fluctuation in the, the value of these assets. So if you're a banker, what can you do about that? How about this? Don't lend long term. There you go. Somebody comes in and says, I want a 30 year loan. You say, No, get out of here. That's not very good. Just lost a good customer. Sell. Or don't, well, sell. What? Uh, long term loans. If you lend money to somebody to buy a house, 30 years, 20 years, just sell off that asset. Okay? By the way, when I said don't lend long term, this would be or purchase bonds, long term bond. Don't buy a 30 year bond. Buy a five year bond. And so what I'm saying is this, if these things are so risky, these 30-year bonds, don't own them. Either don't make the loan or sell it off if you get it. There is a market. How about this one? Okay, make adjustable rate loans. An adjustable rate loan takes care of this problem. The problem is this, is that loan or that bond's got a fixed interest rate on it, and it starts looking bad by comparison if market interest rates go up. So don't do that. If market interest rates go up, have bonds and loans on your books 
where the interest rate goes up on it and keeps them competitive and then the value doesn't go down for those. And the other thing is a financial operation hedge against interest rate movements. Hedging is this. You make, every time you make a long-term loan or buy a long-term bond, every time you do that, you make another investment and so, and that other investment does this. If interest rates go up and that bond or that loan goes down, down in value, then this other investment that you have over here, it will go up in value. And your gains over here, that is to say, you're making another bet that with interest rates. And so if interest rates go up, it gains and offsets these losses. That's a more sophisticated move. Larger banks are doing that, money center banks. These other things are more common for smaller banks, community banks and regional banks. That's it for today, and I will see you next time. So long.